On the 9th of April 2005, crowds lined the streets of Windsor to witness something that had never happened before, the heir to the British throne marrying his mistress. Camilla, Duchess of Cornwall, is possibly the most successful royal mistress in our history, but she learned from an expert, this woman, her own great-grandmother, Alice Keppel, the long-term lover of this man, King Edward VII. Camilla grew up with the legend of Alice Keppel very much in the forefront of her mind. She was determined, if she could, to replicate history. And when Camilla's chance came, she wasn't going to miss it. When Camilla met Charles, she stunned him with perhaps the best chat-up line of the 20th century. My great-grandmother was the mistress of your great-great-grandfather. How about it? And clearly, it did the trick. Camilla's great-grandmother was the most powerful mistress of her age. She could have written the rule book on royal romance. This is the story of Alice Keppel's unstoppable rise and sudden fall. Mrs. Alice Keppel's journey to the top began in 1898, when Britain was ruled over by an aging Queen Victoria. The invention of film and the popularity of magic lantern slides has left us with a vivid picture of her age, its virtues, and its vices. Alice's fortunes were to be shaped by Queen Victoria's eldest son, Edward, known to his friends as Bertie. Prince Edward was first in line to the British throne and an empire on which the sun never set, which had the advantage of making him popular with the ladies. In uh, Victorian times, uh, this was the greatest country in the world. It was by far the largest empire that the world had ever seen. And if you were close to the royal family, you were approaching deity. And Alice Keppel got closer than anybody else. Alice Keppel had an incredible effect on men. She had the figure, she had the tiny waist, the sort of large bosom, this long chestnut hair, alabaster skin, and these piercing blue eyes, which apparently exerted this amazing attraction on men. Historian Kate Williams has been uncovering Alice's incredible story. Her early nickname was Freddy the Flirt because she always had this fabulous aura of attraction. She had a, particularly a very smoky voice, a very sort of low voice that was in a very, apparently quite a dirty laugh. And she smoked in a very sexy way. So she was the prince's ideal girl. The prince's own charms were a little less obvious. Edward, who was 57, he had a 48-inch stomach and he smoked 20 cigarettes and a dozen cigars every day. Physically, he really wasn't much of a catch. He may have been fat, but Edward was soon to become the most powerful fat man in the world, which seemed to do it for Alice. When Alice first caught the eye of her Prince Charming, she was 30 years old and a married woman. There are several different versions of how they actually met. Some say the prince spotted Alice at the races. <laughs> Several aristocrats claim to have introduced them at high society functions. <laughs> Others maintain that the king was inspecting George Keppel's regiment when he first spied the colonel's lovely wife. <laughs> Whatever the truth, there can be no doubt the prince wanted Alice. And when he suggested an afternoon visit to her home, here in Wilton Crescent, Belgravia, Alice would have known exactly what he meant. The practice of, of men visiting their, their mistress in the afternoon, uh, an ostensibly civilised and, and innocent visit, was a very common one which was generally known by the end of the 19th century. Now, 
Remember, it's it's the middle of the afternoon. Whatever you know, the husband is supposed to be doing, he's out doing it. Oh, I think this is very much a, a, yeah a time for for sex and as well as as well as tea. Yeah, two ideal things combined. It was in rooms like this one that Alice would have entertained Edward. Very soon, the prince was dropping round for tea almost every day. His visits always followed a set pattern. He would come and park his carriage in a discreet side street. Throughout the afternoon call, the butler would stand guard outside, ensuring that no one entered while the prince was here. But the secret of Alice's success was that she offered the prince a lot more than just tea and crumpet. Alice was the perfect royal mistress. It was much more than just sexual attraction. She was not just beautiful, she was witty, she was intelligent, and she was discreet. She absolutely knew how to keep the Prince of Wales happy. A skill that would appear to run in the family. Both uh, Camilla and Alice had a deep understanding of men. Both women had a knowledge that each of their princes was in some way isolated from the rest of the world, cocooned from most of society, and these people needed special care and attention. Prince Edward was particularly hard to handle. Edward, Prince of Wales, needed to be entertained all the time. He was a man of fiery temper. He would blow up over, over things that didn't please him. And Alice had the great talent of able to calm him down again and to make him the jovial, genial man that the public loved. <laughs> it was clear that Alice did a lot for Edward. But the question now was, what would Edward do for her? The irrepressible Mrs. Keppel was on her way. In 1898, Mrs. Alice Keppel, the great-grandmother of Camilla, Duchess of Cornwall, began an affair with her very own Prince of Wales. I think there was a streak of ruthless ambition in both uh, Camilla and Alice. Both were determined that, uh, that they should become the number one favorite. Alice quickly achieved her goal. Prince Edward soon nicknamed her his favorita, and high society rushed to embrace the new royal mistress. As the recognized mistress of the Prince of Wales, all of the doors to society were open to her. Alice had finally achieved a dream that had its roots in her early childhood. Alice Keppel was born ambitious. From a very early age, she wanted to be a very important person in society. Alice grew up at Duntreth Castle in Scotland, the ninth daughter of a baronet. Well, this is Duntreth as it was, which was a very big house in those days, and I can remember it as a child. Alice's great-grandniece, Lady Mary MacGregor, met her there in later years. I just have this one clear memory of her coming to stay. And I think I was only about eight, and I was rather overawed by this rather august presence. A very domineering person, is it? I remember her. Alice's childhood at Duntreth had been privileged and carefree. Alice loved Duntreth and always looked on, I think, looked on it as her as home. I think as a little girl, she was a tomboy, yes. And, and of course, it's a magical place to grow up here, as I know. I think it's probably one of the happiest parts of her life was, was living here. But Alice's charmed childhood couldn't last forever. The family estate passed to her brother, and for the youngest of nine daughters, there wasn't much left to go round. I think in those days it was taken for granted that the estate went to the eldest son. To compound matters, Alice married for love. Well, I think this must have been taken about the time of her marriage to Colonel Keppel when she was 23. George Keppel was very good looking and almost an epitome 
of the sort of Edwardian gentleman with his wonderful moustache. And he was absolutely charming and he loved children and called us his little princesses, which we thought was tremendous. <laughs> I think Alice was extremely fond of her husband. They were devoted to each other, very, very close anyway. Mm. As well as love, George offered Alice her first step up the social ladder. He was quite aristocratic. He was the younger son of the Earl of Albemarle. But unfortunately, George was far from rich. He was just an army officer. I don't think he had much money at all. When they were first married, they were very badly off. I think they had to live on, on Colonel Keffel's army pay, more or less. Alice and George moved to London after their marriage in 1921 was impossible, but Alice knew just how to get the bills paid. In the Victorian and the Edwardian era, there was no way in which a socially ambitious, energetic, intelligent woman could advance her position if it wasn't through adultery with a great and high man. The Prince of Wales was not Alice's first adulterous affair. She'd already had an affair with a banker. He had lavished gowns, jewellery, presents on her, of course a god's end for the hard-up Keppels, and then by the age of 30, she'd snagged the Prince of Wales. She'd made it. With Edward's help, Alice would become a very rich woman. Edward did not directly give Alice cash, but he got his financier friends to advise her. By the end of her life, Alice was a millionaire. Given the Keppel's change in fortunes, George was perfectly happy to let his wife get her hands on the crown jewels. George Keppel was a cuckold. He not only forgave the affair, he not only turned a blind eye to the affair, he actually enabled it everywhere that Edward wanted Alice, the dinners, the parties, the receptions, the country house parties, George Keppel would go to and ensure that there was a veil of respectability over the affair. George was rewarded handsomely for his services. Edward got him a well-paid job, membership at the top gentleman's club, and even gave him a medal. People joked that George had received it for laying down his wife for the king. George Keppel may have been happy about the affair, but Edward's wife, Princess Alexandra, was not. Princess Alexandra looked upon Alice Keppel as a complete and utter pain. She found her presence embarrassing. They had rows about Alice. Uh, Edward said to her, well, if you don't like what I do, divorce me. And of course she didn't. Just as Alice Keppel's story is clearly echoed in the life of Camilla, Duchess of Cornwall, Princess Alexandra's has many similarities with Princess Diana. That electric remark, there were three of us in this marriage and it was a bit crowded. Um, Alexandra could have made it of Alice Keppel and everyone would have known what she meant. There can be no doubt that Alexandra now found her marriage overcrowded, but it hadn't always been that way. On her wedding day back in 1863, the marriage had seemed like a fairy tale. Alexandra of Denmark was a renowned beauty when she wed the Prince of Wales at Windsor Castle. She was just 19, and like Diana a century later, Alexandra had been selected because she was a blue-blooded virgin. The newlyweds set up home at Marlborough House on the Mall and settled down to what looked like wedded bliss. 
Initially, the marriage between Edward and Alexandra seemed a perfect match. He seemed very much in love with her. She was beautiful, demure, elegant, restrained. The ideal Princess of Wales. Just like Diana, Alexandra was the people's princess. The great thing was that both women were an adornment to the royal family. They brought beauty, they brought uh, uh, style, and what's more, they made the British public love the royal family more. But it was to be a brief window of marital harmony. Despite producing six children in the first eight years of her marriage, Alexandra never enjoyed a deep emotional relationship with her husband. Alexandra was greatly loved by those around her. She was beautiful, but unfortunately she was thick and she was not a match for Edward's personality. Edward was more and more depressed by his wife. Her body was decimated by the repeated pregnancies. She grew very ill, she became quite deaf, and very soon Edward began to stray and look seriously at other women. In the case of Alexandra, her husband was serially promiscuous, uh, and she was constantly beset by the knowledge that there was some woman in his life, whether she was a, a duchess or a prostitute. If the old queen embodied the pious, moralizing side of Victorian society, then her son Edward represented the pleasure-seeking world of 19th century sex. This was the age when pornography was first mass-produced, and London alone boasted a quarter of a million prostitutes. Edward, the playboy prince, was a loyal customer. Bertie is someone who really does prefer the world of wine, women and song. The man yeah, with a big cigar and the large glass of brandy and the, the woman on each knee. He'd had no role uh, in, in, in government, no, was given no role at all by his mother. What else could he do? He was 50 without a job to do, so he, what he liked, he liked the races, he liked shooting, he liked cards, and he liked women. Edward's appetite for l'amour frequently took him across the channel. At his favourite brothel in Paris, a special double-decker sex chair was even said to have been commissioned to accommodate the prince's enormous paunch and make it easier for him to enjoy several women at once. Curiously, a copy of this amorous antique, known as the Armchair of Love, has turned up in Prague as a popular tourist attraction. This is a love seat. Uh, that chair is a very important uh, thing in uh, English history. I show you like. And uh, two women, one on the top, second on the bottom. And a uh, woman on the top, she has open legs. And a man doing, doing sex with her. And after they change the position, uh, they are changing maybe one man, two women, maybe three women, or two men and one woman. But Edward didn't have to limit his sexual adventures to the sleazy underbelly of society. His friends in the aristocracy were equally keen on extramarital shenanigans themselves. In the late 19th century, high society was absolutely in revolt against the morality of Queen Victoria. Adultery was forgiven, and the prince's friends, the most promiscuous young people of the age, absolutely set the tone of this. This relaxed attitude to adultery was most evident at the lavish house parties where the prince's set spent their weekends, and where Edward now took the opportunity to meet up with his latest mistress, Mrs. Alice Keppel. Kate Williams is visiting Polston Lacey, one of the stately homes where Edward, Alice and Alice's husband, George, all attended parties together. Imagine 
imagine Alice and Edward here, all set for one of their secret tryst, and they would have signed this visitor's book, Welcome to Polesden Lacey. Every visitor who ever came here would sign it. Ah, and there we are. There's Edward, Edward R.I., June the 6th, 1909. And halfway down, we have the huge signature of Alice Keppel, huge and confident, big and bold. And then at the bottom, poor old George Keppel, the husband. <laughs> Even though Alice visited Polston Lacey with her husband, there would have been plenty of opportunity for fun with the prince. Everything about the Edwardian house party had an element of flirtation and sexual intrigue. Men and women would play suggestive piano duets together, communicate through fan signals, then slip notes under one another's door. And finally, they'd arrange discreet meetings The real action of the Edwardian house party was all upstairs. Hostesses went to amazing lengths to ensure they got the sleeping arrangements just right. What they wanted to do was to allow the adulterers to creep around between each other's rooms late at night. So they always gave married couples separate rooms, particularly the couples. Name cards on every door gave all the information guests needed to bed hop and wife swap. As the great late Victorian Edwardian houses get more sophisticated. So do the means by which you know, one can have an affair. It's a, a very well-oiled machine, if one may say that. House party love affairs may have been an open secret, but they were still a secret. The aristocrats' illicit mating game had one unbreakable rule, never publicly acknowledge infidelity. Everyone knew that Edward and Alice were lovers, but there was a veneer of respectability about it. They arrived separately, and in these photos, lying in the corridors, they're pictured, but they're seated far apart. Here's Edward, in between all the gorgeous beauties at the party, and then George Keppel, perched kind of awkwardly behind him. And then Alice, seated a very decent distance away from her darling. Alice Keppel had got adultery down to a very fine art. She could have almost written a manual, you know, on how to be, how to be the perfect mistress. And she knew to keep the illusion of marriage that you pretended one thing while you did another. In order to keep up appearances, Alice had to remain in control of her emotions at all times. The rules of the game were actually, in a way, quite heartless. It went completely haywire when jealousy came into it. It went haywire when deep feeling came into it. And events were about to challenge Alice's cool exterior. She was pregnant, but with whose child? By 1900, Mrs. Alice Keppel, the great-grandmother of Camilla, Duchess of Cornwall, was firmly established as the favourite mistress of Edward, Prince of Wales. But then, Alice found that she was expecting a child. Her royal affair was an open secret in high society, and she knew the unborn baby's parentage could become the subject of speculation. Ever discreet, Alice took herself away from the rumour mongers in London, and travelled to the seaside resort of Weymouth. Historian Kate Williams has come here to explore what was to be a turning point in Alice's relationship with Edward. It was a really vulnerable time for her. Her lover was away, travelling Europe with his wife, and the gossips in London were saying that he was the father of her unborn child. More than ever before, Alice's position was dependent on her princely lover. Just when she needed him most, her lover's life was in grave danger. Dark forces were at work on the continent. On the 4th of April 1900, while travelling in Brussels, Edward was suddenly attacked 
by a gunman protesting against the Boer War in South Africa. The Prince's police bodyguards rush to his aid. Their eyewitness accounts are held at the Metropolitan Police Archives in London. A few minutes before his train was scheduled to leave, Sapido, that's the assassin, cast everything on one great hazard. Leaping onto the footboard of the coach, he jerked out his weapon and sent four shots crashing into the royal compartment. Such was his agitation that every bullet missed. The gunman did actually get so close, another three inches to the left, and, uh, you know, there would have been a, a different monarch on the throne. This was significant not to Alice, not only from the obvious personal point of view, but from the point of view that uh, she and her unborn child's whole security and future depended, if you like, on Edward being alive. Uh, concern, obviously, was, was a very high one. But for the moment, Alice was blissfully unaware of what had happened. Devonshire buildings may not be Weymouth's smartest address today, but in 1900, it was briefly home to the prince's mistress. It was here that Alice first heard the alarming news of the attack directly from the prince himself. He'd been so anxious to reassure her that the first thing he did was shoot off a telegram to Weymouth. In it, he tried to play down the severity of the attack, saying he didn't even think there was a bullet in the gun, which can't have been true. The assassination attempt really taught Alice she'd been playing with fire. She needed Edward. Everything that she had came from her position as his mistress. Without him, she would have been right back where she started. And Alice was never going to let that happen. As her pregnancy continued, she made sure nothing would threaten her royal relationship, which, for her, meant avoiding scandal at all costs. Everyone knew how bad things could get for a pregnant royal mistress when the prince's affairs were publicly exposed. Thirty years earlier, as a young married man, Edward had seen his reputation dragged through the mud when one of his mistresses spilled the beans. The scandal unfolded in 1866, when newlywed Lady Harriet Mordaunt first moved into her husband's grand Warwickshire home. So this is Walton Hall, where Harriet came when she was only 18. She esteemed her husband, Sir Charles, but she didn't love him. Instead, she'd been swept up into the glamorous world of the Prince of Wales and his fast set. She'd even begun a passionate affair with Bertie himself. Sir Charles warned his wife to stay away from the Playboy Prince, but Harriet didn't listen. It was on this lawn where Sir Charles meted out a terrible punishment to his errant wife. She'd promised him that she would never receive the Prince of Wales at home, but one day Sir Charles returned early from a fishing trip and found her flaunting herself and her two new white ponies and her beautiful carriage in front of the Prince. Incensed, he sent the Prince away and then he dragged Lady Harriet down onto the lawn and forced her to watch as he shot both the ponies. But Harriet carried on as if nothing had happened. She continued to entertain several lovers, including the Prince of Wales, and soon became pregnant. Lady Elizabeth Hamilton, a member of the Mordaunt family, has uncovered Edward's secret correspondence with Harriet. So this is one of the Prince's actual letters to Lady Mordaunt. Yes, there were quite a few of them, and she locked them all away in her private cabinet Very so that her husband didn't know about them. But this one was written when um, Harriet was already pregnant. He wrote, I fear I shall not see you for a long time. 
but trust to find you perhaps in London. I hope you will remain strong and well and wishing you a very pleasant winter. I remain yours most sincerely, Albert Edward. <laughs> Gosh. So really he's saying, you know, as soon as you've had the baby, come up to London and, and we'll have fun. Yeah, we'll start again. And we'll start again. It won't make any, make any difference. No. But the prince was mistaken. Harriet's baby was to change everything. The birth unlocked her guilty feelings and led to a dreadful confession. She told her husband that she'd had sex with Edward and several of his philandering friends. Devastated, Sir Charles sued for divorce. Order! This was bad news for the Prince of Wales. He was summoned to Westminster Hall to appear as a witness, and it became common knowledge that he had been paying afternoon calls to Harriet Mordaunt. The possibility that the Prince of Wales was going to be called to account in the divorce trial was utterly scandalous. To many people, this would have thrown the monarchy into absolute disrepute. The Times was printing his letters saying, I'll meet you at five o'clock in the afternoon. The questions were asked, why was he going at five o'clock in the afternoon to see this young woman whose husband was away? Britain's newly emerging tabloid press, ravenous for saucy stories about the prince, lapped up the scandal. If unbridled sensuality and lust have led him to violate the laws of honour and hospitality, then such a man is utterly unfit and unworthy to rule over this country. The Prince of Wales appearing in court was a, a great media event of the time, but it, it really, unfortunately for the prince, set, set, set his reputation at, at I think, an all-time low. Queen Victoria knew she had to act to save the monarchy. There was a shocking cover-up. The Queen and the ministers were absolutely adamant that Edward would not be cross-examined in the witness box, which was an absolute scandal. Essentially, he got off scot-free. And the cover-up didn't stop there. This is a, a letter that was written by Dr Gull, mm -hmm. who was uh, very much... Uh, Prince's personal doctor. We unanimously agree that Lady Mordaunt is mentally incapable and in our judgment is incompetent to the care of herself or her affairs. If Harriet were declared insane, her confession of adultery with a prince could be written off as the ranting of a madwoman. So to spare his blushes, she was locked away in an asylum for the rest of her life. Given Harriet's fate, it was little wonder that Edward's latest lover, Alice Keppel, trod so carefully during her pregnancy. On the 24th of May, 1900, Alice gave birth to a baby girl, who she called Sonia. She never uttered a word about the parentage of her new baby, but several facts could indicate that Sonia was possibly the prince's child. Many people believe that Sonia Keppel was actually Edward's daughter. There are three main reasons that suggest this. First of all, the timing. She's born right in the high noon of the affair between Edward and Alice. Secondly, Edward's reaction. When the baby was born, he filled Alice's house with roses. And you wouldn't really do this unless it was going to be your child. Thirdly, Sonia herself seemed to think that she was Edward's child. In fact, she entitled her autobiography Edwardian Daughter. There's a, a strong line of thought that uh, Sonia Keppel, Camilla's grandmother, was in fact King Edward VII's uh, natural daughter. But Alice Keppel never, ever said herself whether she was. However, if she was, that would make Camilla and Charles second cousins once removed. Sonia grew up at the Keppel's new home in Portman Square, and George Keppel seemed to have been more than happy with the role of father. Of course, this suited the Prince of Wales perfectly, especially as he was soon to have other things on his mind. On the 22nd of January, 1901, at the age of 81, Queen Victoria breathed her last. She had ruled the nation for 63 years. Before her death, 
Victoria had made her views very clear to her son. As the new king, he must break with his inappropriate friend. We can only assume that the group she was referring to would have included Alice Keppel. But Edward was his own man. He decided to flaunt his playboy lifestyle in the most public of arenas, his own coronation. Watching here is the footage of Edward VII's coronation on 9th of August 1902. What we see is the really official version of what went on. See, here we are, the sort of waving clouds and the beautiful carriages drawn by all those fantastic horses. What we don't see is the other story behind the beautiful facade. While the cameras rolled outside the abbey, Inside, the congregation soon realised that their new king had compiled a rather unorthodox guest list. There was Alice sitting alongside one or two of Edward's other lady friends in a part of the abbey that was known as the King's Loose Box. Usually, a loose box is a home for horses, and at Edward's coronation, it certainly housed his favourite fillies. This was one of the jocular ways that society described the coming together of these lady friends in parallel with Edward's great interest in racehorses. Alice was now the mistress and confidant of the most powerful man in the world. These doors that had opened to her in society now became gilded doors. There were no uh, elements of society that did not now include Alice. Alice was never just a pretty face, and now her brain has came into their own. Unusually for a mistress, she became an important political player. Alice was no mere mistress, no mere frivolous amusement. She had real political influence, as Sir Charles Hardinge, head of the Foreign Office, wrote. Everybody knew of the friendship that existed between King Edward and Mrs George Keppel, and to the excellent influence which she always exercised upon the King. I was able, through her, to advise the King with a view to the policy of the government being accepted. She was very loyal to the king and patriotic at the same time. Edward deliberately uses her, uh, her intelligence, her good looks, let's face it, to charm and win over um, leading foreign diplomats, leading foreign sovereigns. You know, she, he perfectly happily has her talking to the Kaiser. So Edward sees that she's an enormous asset and after 1901 really uses her in a very active political way. If Edward now seemed happy to show off his mistress in front of important heads of state, it is perhaps no surprise that the general public had also become aware of Alice. When Edward went to the theater or to a concert, uh, just with his entourage without Alice, the assembled public outside the door to see him would shout, where's Alice? As with Camilla years later, the royal mistress had gradually become publicly acceptable. If you said, how's Alice? Everybody would know immediately who you meant, that it was Alice Keppel. But Alice's charmed life at the pinnacle of society was in danger. Her royal sugar daddy was already an old man. Years of drinking, smoking and overeating had taken their toll on Edward's health. By 1910, his days were numbered. High society watched, waited, and wondered what would become of Alice Keppel. On the 6th of May, 1910, Edward VII lay dying at Buckingham Palace. Alice Keppel's future hung in the balance. She was frantic with grief and worry, desperate to see her royal protector one last time. Queen Alexandra was adamant that she didn't want that woman 
anywhere near a dying husband. But Alice had a trick up her sleeve. She presented Alexandra with a letter Edward had written nine years earlier, which is meant to have contained these powerful lines. My dear Mrs. George, should I be taken very seriously ill, I hope you will come and cheer me up. I feel convinced that all those who have any affection for me will carry out my wishes, which I have expressed in these lines. Yours most sincerely, Edward R. And Queen Alexandra could hardly refuse Alice after reading that. Against her better judgment, Queen Alexandra allowed her love rival to enter the palace. Now, Alice prepared a nice story for society that she had been invited to the palace by Queen Alexandra, who had welcomed her, had kissed her, had stood at the king's deathbed with Alice, promising Alice that whatever happened to the king, Alice would be looked after. Now this was complete and utter rubbish. Alice had been the soul of discretion throughout the king's life, but she lost her dignity completely at his deathbed. As Lord Isha, who was present at the scene, reported in horror. The king did not recognize Mrs. Keppel and kept falling forward. The king was in a coma and Alice became hysterical. She kept repeating, I never did any harm. There was nothing wrong between us. And then, what is to become of me? She fell into a wild fit of hysterics. For several hours, she was in a hysterical state before they could get her out of the palace. Altogether, it was a painful and rather theatrical exhibition and ought never to have happened. Alice completely lost the plot. She could see that once the king was dead, that royal doors would be shut to her. And if royal doors were shut to her, a lot more doors in society would be shut to her. It's very sad for Alice. I think it's a very tragic moment for her, uh, realising that suddenly it's all going to be over, all completely. I mean, all those grand events she went to, there'll be nothing like that ever again. But was there more to Alice's grief than the loss of her exalted position in society? Many people see Alice as an adventurer, simply there for social prominence, climbing up through society. But I think it's impossible that she didn't love Edward at least a little bit, because she was his mistress for 12 years, she made him happy, she put up with his terrible temper tantrums. I think, under it all, there was a real feeling of friendship, companionship, and also affection between them. Queen Alexandra lost no time shutting Alice out of high society. The king's one-time favourita, was not even allowed to sign the Book of Condolences. Alice and George fled abroad and spent many of their remaining years living in self-imposed exile in Italy. Their extraordinary marriage survived to the end. When Alice died in 1947, George was heartbroken and within weeks had followed her. It was the end of an era, but not the end of the family affair. Nearly 100 years later, Alice's great-granddaughter, Camilla, married her prince. If Alice could look down and see her great-granddaughter uh, married to the Prince of Wales, I think she'd be horrified. I think she believed in discretion, at not upsetting the royal apple cart. And then I think there would have been something else. I think she would have been deeply jealous of Camilla. Although Alice was content to occupy the place of the mistress, she was hugely socially ambitious, so she would have seen Camilla's amazing success in marrying her Prince of Wales as a great achievement, and she would have possibly been just a little bit in awe of her great-granddaughter. 